This is the third part of a tutorial on image acquisition and needling technique in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. In the first part, we covered the scanning phase and how to obtain an optimal image and plan the needle approach. In the second part, we talked about probe and needle manipulation to localize the needle tip and guide it safely to the target nerve using both in-plane and out-of-plane approaches. The third and final phase in the technical performance of ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia is the injection and delivery of local anesthetic around the target nerve. I firmly subscribe to the view that every nerve lies within a fascial compartment. My aim is to identify this compartment, enter it without touching the nerve, and filling the compartment with local anesthetic. Nerves are composed of fascicles, each surrounded by an endoneurum and perineurum, and the bundles of fascicles make up an individual nerve are surrounded by an epineurium. Around the nerve or nerves are layers of paraneural connective tissue. My aim is to enter within the paraneural fascial sheath but no further. This sheath directs and confines local anesthetic distribution around the target nerve. This next slide illustrates the paraneural sheath that I see around common nerve targets. There are two in the infraclavicular plexus, for example, containing the lateral cord and posterior and medial cords. The axillary plexus also has at least two, with the radial nerve always within its own compartment distinct from the median and ulnar nerves. In the supraclavicular plexus, the superior trunk and divisions are usually very clearly separate from the other elements. And in the femoral nerve, we have the fascia lata traveling superficial to the artery and the fascia iliaca, which splits to envelop the femoral nerve in a compartment before running deep to the artery. This next sequence illustrates the concept of how to safely pierce and enter any paraneural sheath of a nerve. Avoid contact with the nerve if possible. Just aim to enter the potential space between the two opposing fascial layers. I therefore usually aim to pierce the fascia a little distance away from the nerve itself. Remember that you are trying to pierce a tough fascia layer with a blunt needle, and therefore significant tenting and stretch of the fascia will occur before it is pierced. Look to see that the nerve is rolling away as the needle is pressed forward. This means that it is not at risk of transfiction as you pierce through. The needle should be advanced in a smooth controlled motion rather than a jabbing or stabbing motion. Piercing of the fascia is signaled by a tactile and visual pop as tissues rebound to their original position. The needle tip will usually lie deep to the fascial envelope. It therefore needs to be withdrawn slightly. Hydrolocation is used to confirm where it is lying. If within muscle, this fluid will produce expansion of the muscle. Rather than withdrawing and injecting and withdrawing and injecting, it helps to ask your assistant to very slowly inject one mil of fluid and as they are injecting, to withdraw the needle slowly and smoothly. As the needle then enters the potential space between the two layers, the fluid that is being injected will open up the space. Further injection can then be performed within the paraneural space. Most of the time, repositioning is not needed. So to summarize, do not jab but advance the needle in a constant and controlled manner. Expect tenting of the tissues and distortion. The needle can look a lot deeper than it really is. Control is important because you have to be ready to back off and release the forward pressure on the needle once you feel or see the pop of the layer. Always aim at a tangent and slightly away from the nerve or underlying structure that you don't want to pierce. And remember that tough layers are easier to pierce with blunt needles if approached at a steeper angle. I will often deliberately steepen to pierce the fascia and then once through it, I will readjust the needle to a flatter trajectory to approach the nerve. This illustrates not advancing directly onto a nerve, but at one side at a tangent to its circumference. The needle and the nerve should roll or slide to one side as the fascia is pierced. This rolling motion of the nerve is further illustrated here, signaling that the needle can be advanced with little risk 
to the nerve, or in this case, the lateral cord. Here, we are passing between the median nerve and the axillary artery. Neither are at risk of being transfixed because we are tangential to both structures. This video illustrates how, if the trajectory is too shallow, the needle glances off the fascia instead of piercing it. A steeper approach away from the superior trunk pierces the fascia, and then the needle can be flattened to bring the tip close to the target. Repositioning to achieve circumferential spread is not always needed. Remember that the local anesthetic does not just spread in one cross-sectional plane, but travels up and down along the nerve. So scan along the course of the nerve while injecting to assess the spread and where the local anesthetic is going before deciding if you actually need to reposition the needle tip. Finally, it is just as important to recognize inappropriate local anesthetic spread. I do not recommend deliberate intraneural injection, which for me means any injection beneath the epineurium. Intraneural injection should be suspected if the patient complains of pain or injection, or if there is resistance to injection. Now, pain is not a very sensitive or specific marker, but it should always prompt you to carefully reevaluate where you are. Similarly, resistance is usually a result of the needle tip being pressed up against a fascial layer rather than within the nerve. But again, it should prompt reevaluation. Expansion of the nerve is the hallmark of being within the epineural sheath. It is impossible to tell if the injectate is being contained just under the epineurium or is subperineural or even intrafascicular, and thus should be avoided in my opinion. The only good news is that if you do accidentally inject a small volume intraneurally, it rarely results in clinically significant injury. It goes without saying that intravascular injection should also be avoided. Aspiration before injection should always be done, but it can be misleading, particularly if veins are collapsed or, as happens, too much force and negative pressure is applied to the plunger by your assistant. The key thing to note is whether or not you see fluid spread when you do your test injection of half a mil. If you do not, it must prompt re-evaluation of where the needle tip is. It may simply be that you have not got the needle tip in proper alignment in view, or it may mean that the local anesthetic is entering a blood vessel. Regardless, carefully reassess as to where your needle tip is actually located. So in summary, the general principles of needling are as follows. Always approach nerves or blood vessels at a tangent if you do not wish to pierce them. Advance your needle in a smooth, controlled manner, being ready to back off any pressure once you pierce a given layer. Use hydrolocation and hydrodissection of small amounts of fluid to clear a path and produce a safe passage for your needle to advance into rather than driving your needle into tissues themselves. It helps to probe before you puncture looking to confirm that the structure you're about to puncture is a fascial layer rather than a solid structure like a nerve which you have failed to spot on ultrasound. Remember when trying to pierce a fascial layer that it is very elastic and tough and so you can expect significant tenting, distortion, but once through you will see a visual evidence of a recoil or bounce back accompanied by a tactile pop. Use what I call an epidural technique, where once you feel that pop or see that bounce back, you relax your forward pressure and not advance any further. Finally, as you do your test injections of half a mil, look for the appropriate pattern of fluid spread. What you want to achieve is a compartmental spread within the perineal sheath. And remember that at all times, both hands have to be making these small micro movements to achieve this process of dynamic scanning and needling, which will help you locate your needle tip. I'm going to finish off with an illustration of these principles with an actual block performance video, in this case of an auxiliary block. It is unclear here if the median nerve is lying at one o'clock to the artery, but gentle probing 
suggests that there is a solid structure rolling under the needle tip. We have two choices here, either to try and pass under the median nerve or above the median nerve. Either way, a controlled needle advancement tangential to the nerves combined with hydrodissection opens up a safe passage for the needle tip without causing trauma to the underlying structures. Note how I dip the tip of the needle to go under the radial nerve rather than straight at it. And rather than engage in too much needle manipulation, I focus on filling up fascial compartments with local anesthetic and letting the injection of local anesthetic do the work for me of spreading around the various nerves. The final targeting of the musculocutaneous nerve illustrates the concept of piercing fascial envelopes that we discussed earlier. Note the tenting, the bounce back as the fascia is pierced, and the compartmental spread as the needle tip is maneuvered into the right location. <laughs> 